Hi everyone, trying to get my picture set up here so I can talk to you today. Um, I wanted to share with you um, uh, something that God had um, showed me even this morning that I really wanted to um, wanted to um, share with you. Um, I've been studying and looking at uh, communion. Like that's my theme for the year. I think I had mentioned that before that I've been talking a lot about communion and studying a lot about um, communion. And so this morning uh, when I woke up, I I woke up and God woke me up this morning at like six something. And um, what I God was the word communion again, and then God started telling me about knowing God and what that has to do with communion. And so, um, before I get started, I just want to say a word of prayer that you'll you'll be able to kind of see this in the same context that I saw it, and and really be able to uh, receive it and accept it um, in the way I'm going to explain. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. We thank you and we praise you, God, because you speak to us and and we can hear you, Lord God, and. I thank you, Lord God, for communicating with us. I thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to commune with you. And I pray, Lord God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, God, will be acceptable on my sight. I'm praying, Lord, that you will open open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you know what? First of all, um, just go with me to Luke chapter 24. We're just going to start there. i got like a couple of notes here, so don't mind me. But um, t flip your Bibles over to Luke chapter 24, and we're going to take a look starting at verse 13. So Luke 24, 13, and it reads like this. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, uh, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto him, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted it had been that we trusted that it had been he which would have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre, and when they found not his body, they came, saying they had also seen a vision of angels, which said he was alive, and a certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre, and found it even so, as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, ought not Christ to have suffered these things, and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further, but they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread, and blessed it, and brake it, and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us, while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour, and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with him, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and how he was known of them and breaking of bread. This was powerful to me this morning, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Like, I've been looking at communion, and I've been um, studying that word, and I've been just meditating on communion and on the Last Supper of Christ, um, when he took the bread, and he blessed the bread, and he broke it, and he gave it, and uh, what that truly symbolized. And in a previous uh, vlog, I talked about how Jesus was with them, and he was the bread of life, and how he... Um, actually was broken for us and given for us his blood spilled out for us which is the wine that we take in communion um, similar to the Last Supper and how that when Jesus was with them he was the bread of life and at that time his disciples did not need to fast but then he went away and now we fast but then when we get to heaven it will be the marriage supper of the Lamb and there will be no need to fast anymore and so <clears throat> 
I had talked about that fasting piece, but then God showed me something new. Um, for one thing, it, there's a very different picture of actually knowing about Jesus, knowing of Jesus, and knowing who he is. These disciples who were on the road with him did not know who he was. They did not recognize him, which is like, who doesn't know Jesus? You know, who doesn't know the Son of God? He just died on a cross. How do they not recognize him? Could it be because his, his, his you know, face was marred from before? Could it be that, you know, they just didn't recognize him because they never knew him? Is it because they didn't recognize him because they had never seen him before? Or is it because you know, as the Bible says, their eyes were holding. So something about the way they saw was not, it, 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 they, did, they couldn't see Christ um, for whatever reason. And so, of course, like that just, you know, begs the question, why can't some people see Jesus? You know, why can't some people actually engage with who he is? And so you see in verse, six, uh, verse 15 that they commune together. In verse 16, uh, 15, they commune together. In 16, they did not know him. In 17, um, I mean, in verse 29 through 31, Jesus is going to abide with them. He takes the bread. He blesses it. He breaks bread with them, and then they know him. It's in the breaking of the bread that they know him. And it's in the breaking of Christ's body that we come to know God and that we come to know Christ. And you can only know God in, in an intimate way and, and understand who he is by accepting Jesus by understanding that he was broken for you and understanding that God allowed that to happen so that we could have a relationship with him and we could have communion with him because the word communion is more than just the last supper but it is also a relationship it's communication it is community um, it's a picture of the body of Christ and so what God pointed out to me today the second part is that when the Last Supper actually occurred, um, when the disciples were with Jesus and they were breaking bread and he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you and here's the wine, take this and drink it in remembrance of me. It's in the remembrance of me that caught my attention because first of all, right, we don't understand who God is until we come to know him through the breaking of the bread and that's when, when we get a realization of who God is to us and who God is, period. But the thing is with, the, with uh, the whole idea of communion, you can't remember what you don't know. You can't recall what you've never seen. You can't remember someone that you've never met. And so it is in the knowing of God, number one, that's most important. Number two, you can't remember who you don't know. So when we take communion, when we take the Lord's Supper, we are remembering, we are recalling the breaking of the body of Christ, the spilling of the blood of Jesus for our sins so that we can have communion with God. And so communion is literally the word um, communion is like a unity. It's a coming together. And when we take communion, we are actually remembering Christ. Think about the word remember. If you break that into two words, you got re and you got member. We're putting something back together. We remember the body of Christ. We are all members of the body of Christ. We're all members of one body with one purpose to glorify God, to represent God here on the earth. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. When we take communion and when we all come together, because the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Um, this is what the early church did right after Jesus ascended up to heaven and he left them this was shortly after you know Passover that he was crucified right so they had the Passover meal and that was the time that they had the Last Supper he died on the cross he appeared to uh, these disciples on um, on the road to Emmaus right and it's during this time that he says remember remember who I am remember what I'm telling you I'm gonna leave the Holy Spirit to help you remember it's the remembering that happens in the body of Christ every time we get together on a Sunday morning, every time we take communion, every time we break bread together, we remember the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We remember the blood that was shed on the cross for our sins and we come together. We reunite. We commune and we come into a unity. 
And so the word remember, when I looked it up, it says to put back together, to organize, to recall, to recollect, to call to mind, to bequeath or leave something to someone, to commemorate, to pay homage, to recover after a lapse, to remain aware of and to retain in the memory. What I'm getting from this is during communion, when we take that communion, we do it to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. We do it together so that we can come together and be together. It's a picture of the oneness that God um, desires for his church. And it's a picture of the oneness of the bride of Christ and Jesus Christ coming together once again. The Bible is just so full of, of this metaphor of oneness. And of course, um, of course, it lends itself right to marriage. Christ and the church, the bride of Christ, a bride and a groom. Every time a bride and a groom come together, they remember the body and the blood that was spilled in their coming together. When a woman loses her virginity for the first time, there is blood that is shed. There is a part of her body that's broken. The hymen is broken and blood is spilled out. And so that's why it's so detrimental when people get married and and there's no there's no blood. It's like where's the covenant blood? Where's the sacrifice? Oh, oh, well I I got rid of that a long time ago when I was fooling around with little Johnny and we had sex and whoops. My blood was spilled before I got married. This is the picture of what God was trying to show us from the beginning. The body and the blood. Way before we knew Christ, his blood was spilled for us. He wanted us to be one with him. Only him. Not any, not just any Joe Schmo on the street. The, body, the word of God says, you know, why join God's body to a harlot? Why join that thing together? That's not the covenant. The covenant is body and blood, a husband and wife coming together. And every time they come together again, every time there's intercourse, there is a remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. We even see this when uh, the Bible tells us that when you fast, if you're married, that you come back together so that you aren't tempted to have sex with anybody else, that you're not tempted to, to not be together and to destroy the remembrance and to destroy the intercourse that a husband and wife are supposed to have together. It's to commemorate the first time. And that's why God is saying communion, communion, one, unity, a oneness, a wholeness. So God says in the word of God, do this in remembrance of me. Remember what I have done. When you are with your spouse, remember what I have done. Okay? This is a remembrance is um, a retained mental impression. This is supposed to stay on our minds. It's supposed to always come to mind what Christ has done. That's why we do it so often. He says every time you come together, every time you break bread together. That's why some people um, pray over their food. And they say, thank you, God, for this food. You know, if it hadn't been for you, dying on the cross, shedding your blood, breaking your body, I would not have, you know, food before you. And I thank you. And taking moments every day to remember, 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 remember. This word is so rich to me right now because I know that there are people who don't know Christ. Because I know that there are people who can't remember because they've never known him. And that's what the Bible says is that, there's going to be people that, that in the end, you know, when judgment comes and God's going to say, I never knew you. I never knew you. How, how awful would it be that Jesus died on the cross, that he shed his blood, that he, his body was broken so that we could remember what he's done for us. And when the time comes for us all to gather together into oneness, he says, I don't remember you. You're not going to be remembered by me because I never knew you. If you don't know Jesus today, it is paramount that you know him. Not just know of him, not just read about him in the Bible, but that you know him for yourself. 
even the very word no is, is symbolic of, of sex and of that union. To know someone is to know them intimately, to be a part of them and they be a part of you. If God is not a part of you, you are not a part of his body and you cannot be remembered. Jesus has gone to prepare a place for his bride, a place for the members of his church, his body. I've heard people say, just in the last couple of days, I was talking to a friend. She's like, yeah, Jesus is my pastor. Why? Because he is the head of the church. He is the head of his church. And he is going to prepare a place for us. And he's going to remember his church back together. And you want to be a part of that. When Jesus comes back, and he is coming back, you have to know and you have to believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, broke his body, shed his blood, left and said, you know, do this in remembrance of me. Join other people to the body. Bring other people into our oneness. Add to my church because I'm coming back to remember you. The other thing that I saw is the whole part of not neglecting to remember. The, the, body, the, the Bible says clearly to the church, don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. It said to the husband and wife, don't neglect the assembling of yourselves together. This is important, or it wouldn't be in the Bible both ways. It, it's in there both ways for the church and for marriages because marriage is a symbol of the church. And so... The whole idea of sex is communion. The whole idea of marriage is communion. The whole idea of the church is communion. Uh, taking the Lord's Supper, it's communion. So don't neglect that. It makes us one. It's only when you're fasting that you don't. The only time it should be uh, put aside for a season, just a season, is if you're fasting. If you're putting away the bread for a moment to concentrate solely on God himself. That's the only time that a husband and wife should not be together. And so you come back together, you do this in remembrance. You do this to remember your initial covenant so you will not be tempted. When, when we don't do this the way God has said, it brings a great temptation. If you've ever, if you've lost your virginity, let's say you uh, committed adultery, and um, your remembrance of your first time is not with your husband, it's not with your spouse then every single time you have sex, you remember somebody else. You remember your first time. You remember maybe the second time. You remember this guy. You remember that guy. You remember this girl. You remember she did this. He did that. God wants us to remember him. This is why it's important because there is temptation there. If you've committed sin and then you try not to commit that sin again, it's the memories that taunt you. It's not... You know, your body is going to crave a union. It's going to crave communion. <laughs> and without communion, you're, you're fasting. But if you are fasting, then you need to hold fast. If you are not married, hold your fast. If you are married, then you need to be having communion. Because it's only when you are not having communion that you need to be fasting. And that's if you're not married. That's if, if you're divorced. If you, if, you're not, if you don't have somebody to be one with in the biblical sense of oneness, then you ought to be fasting. You ought to be waiting. You ought to be coming before God and presenting your body to him a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto him because that's your reasonable service. That's just what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be getting ready, training your mind to stay on Christ. The other thing I saw in this, flip with me to one other passage of scripture. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's look at this. Let's look at this. And you can see how, how powerful this is and, and why God woke me up to show this to me because this is a big picture of Christ and the church and, and the Lord's Supper. It's, it's the whole thing. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and I'm going to read this verses uh, 27 through 32. It says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body 
and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. If any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together into condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Hallelujah. Ooh, Lord, help me, help me to share this. Eating and drinking unworthily. We started to begin to touch on that a little bit. If, if, you, if you're having memories of, of eating or drinking unworthily. If you've ever taken communion and you did not know the Lord, how can you partake in his body? You can't remember who you don't know. That's the first part of it. Um, a part of discerning and, and knowing and judging the truth, it, it's all part of knowing. It's all part of the knowing God package, okay? So when we don't know the Lord and we attempt to partake in something that is not for us, we can get weak. We can get sick. We can die. Do you know, being a nurse, I have seen so many people get weak, sick, and die from sexually transmitted diseases, um, fooling around, having sex in all kinds of ways with animals, with, with more than one person, three sons, four sons. Ridiculous. This is not what God intended in his word. Many are weak, many are sick, and many are dead. We're talking about AIDS, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, um, sharing needles, sharing blood in ways that it shouldn't be. That's, that's like the strange fire of the Levites and, and of the priests and people who call themselves people of God who are not. This is not God's will. This is not God's will. Doing sex in any other way besides what is prescribed in the word of God between one man and one woman is not of God. And so we have to discern the Lord's body. If, if you say you're a Christian, then your body is God's body. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And how dare you use that temple and, and put it with something that is not of God. This is not pleasing to the Lord. I looked up um, unworthy or unworthily, as it says in the KJV, and it says irreverent. Do you know that sex is irreverent? Thing. Do you know that taking of communion is a reverent thing? It's something between you and God alone that you do. You confess your sins. You come before God as a clean vessel. You ask God to forgive you of your sins, and you take communion with him. You take communion with him. And so to do that irreverently causes all kinds of repercussions, causes all kinds of things that are unacceptable to God. Treating sex as if it's not holy, as if it's not special, as if it's not, um, as if it's casual, casual sex. That's what they call it. Like, I'm going to go out tonight, meaning I'm going to sleep with somebody that I met at the club. Really? That's irreverent. That's irreverent if, if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. No, we cannot do that. You know why? Because Jesus is waiting for us. And we're waiting for him. Because in Revelations, we see the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is when Jesus said, I'm not going to drink of this cup until we come back together. I'm waiting for you. I'm making a house for you. I'm getting everything set for you. Please, don't cheat on me while I'm gone. Please, I'm going to, 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 to heaven to, to make our bed, to, 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 to make this the most glorious thing ever so we can experience the real oneness, the way... Sex is just a symbol, people. It's just a symbol of what God wants to show us in what real oneness is. And so Jesus will set these things in order when he comes. And he is coming. To set is to reconstruct, to put something back together, to remember something. It's like a surgeon who, who rejoins um, two bones back together. They, they set them in right order. And that's what God is going to do to rejoin his church back together, to set us, to set everything right. In your past, things may not have been set right. Huh. Perhaps, perhaps even when you were young, it's not your fault that things weren't set right. That somebody stole something that didn't belong to them and, and took something from your body. And they messed up. 
your members. They took your virginity. They took something. And God said, you know what? I'm going to set it right. I'm going to set it in order when I come. Oh, you're not missing out. Oh, no. God is going to set you in order. And you will be able to be remembered by God. He's going to say, oh, yes, I know you. I know you by name. I know every hair on your head. I know you. And he's going to set it up for us. The Bible says that he's going to set a place before us in the presence of our enemies. The very people who thought they were stealing something from you. The very people who, who, who ruined sex for you forever. The very people who jacked up your church experience and said this is the way church needs to be done. Oh no, God says I'm going to set it in order when I come. This is the table I'm going to set for you in the presence of your enemies. I'm going to lay out the, pl pl uh, the place setting so fine. This is going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. <laughs> the other day, <clears throat> the other day, uh, I was upset because I was washing dishes and uh, our dishwasher broke. It wasn't washing dishes correctly and, I, and my dishes got etched. And it doesn't look right. You know, when you have nice dishes, you want to set the table out and make it nice. You want to set it out really, you know, pretty for your guests or whatever. I couldn't do that. And it just... God brought that back to my remembrance this morning. <laughs> brought it back to my remembrance. But he, he, he brought that to my remembrance about the place setting. And he reminded me I needed to buy a place setting. And he says, you know what? I'm going to set a place that like you've never seen. I'm going to set you up like you've never seen. You thought marriage was good. You thought sex was good. You thought church was good. You ain't seen nothing yet. He's going to set a place for us. And he's going to set that for us. When you think of a set, even, you think of a set is two. A set is a pair. A set is a couple. It's always Christ and the church joined together, being remembered in communion. It's a place where we come together in God. And I can't wait to be in that place with God, to see him face to face, to know him. Hallelujah, as I am known. If you don't know him today in the pardon of your sins, oh, accepting God is the very best thing you could ever, ever do. To know him is to know love. To know love is to know God. And to know God is all you need to know. Let's pray together. Oh, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah. God, I thank you and I praise you, God, for every person under the sound of my voice today. I thank you, Lord God, for opening up and revealing even more about communion, about your body, about your blood. Thank you, God, for being broken for us, for dying for us, for spilling your blood for us. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for your church that you've established, God. I thank you so much, Lord, that you've called us to be a part of your body. You've given us a, a great commission. You've given us, Lord God, everything that pertains to life and godliness, Lord. You feed us and you grow us and you teach us to feed others, oh God, at your table. Oh God, I just thank you and I praise you for, for the beautiful symbolism that you've given us in the word of God and through marriage, Lord, where a husband and wife come together and where you show us the breaking of the body and the spilling of the blood. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, God, for... Thank you, God. Your blood and your body. That blood, Lord God, that you spilled on the cross that day has never lost its power. It still has the power to heal. It still has the power to connect us. It's the bridge from, from heaven to earth, oh God. And I thank you for the blood, the blood of Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that if anyone does not know you, Lord God, that they will come to know you, oh God, and that they will remember and that they will go to church and that they won't, won't forsake the assembling of themselves together, that they won't forsake, Lord God, the coming together as husband and wife, Lord God, but that we will represent you, represent your church at all times and in all ways. And we'll give your name thanks and praise for everything. Thank you for this word. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you, God. Amen. Thank you.